Well, my name is Jim Eddy. I was a navigator on 419 Squadron. We were flying Lancasters. We had a crew of seven. And we did 15 trips and we were shot down. Um, I was the only one that escaped from the burning plane. The other guys, the other six guys were killed. It's kind of sad. But anyway, I was taken a prisoner and became a prisoner of war and was liberated when the war ended. Wow. Uh, yeah. I, I was only in prison, yeah, about five months. Just the regular bombing missions. I didn't get there till uh, oh, late in '44, I think it was, and the, we were, we bombed. Um, I forget the name, some. I forget some of the targets. I was shot down on my on my 15th trip, but we had bombed in the Ruhr and um, uh, various places in Germany, and uh, Dusseldorf, and uh, we were quite successful until we got shot down, that is. <laughs> wow. What was your inspiration to oh. join the Air Force as opposed to well, the Navy or? <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's not a question to ask. Eh? <laughs> well, at, at that time, uh, in 1940, I was 20 years old, so I knew I was going to have to go in something. And the Air Force was the thing to go in because that was the, the preferred um, service as far as young people are concerned. It was very glamorous to fly and and uh, I tried to get in, but my I didn't have a, I had bad eyesight, so I couldn't get in the um, Air Force right away. But then they brought uh, the latter part of um, 41 and early 42. They brought out a ruling that people whose eyes weren't 100 percent could get in, and they would supply them with goggles so they could fly. So, so I got in then in uh, 42, and uh, I started out as a to be a pilot. But I was washed out on I was flying Tiger Moss, and uh, strangely enough, I lived in Fort William, and that's where we did our training. And I was washed out on my 60-hour check. And uh, the, the the guy that washed me out, he was a, um, I guess he was a senior flying officer on the station. He said, Jim, he says I'll let you go on, but he says you might be better doing another part of the air crew. So. He, I became a navigator. And then from there I went back to Portage the Prairie. And from there I went to, uh, no, I went back to Brandon and then to Portage the Prairie where I did my navigation course. It took six months. And I graduated the latter part of 43. And then I went overseas. Wow. So you were 21 by then or 20, still 20? Uh, I was 20, uh, 22 by then, yeah. 22. 22, yeah. Wow. So when you arrived in, in England, how was that? Just arriving in a new country, young man, all uh, these yeah. squadrons? It was great. <laughs> <laughs> it was? Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the English people welcomed, people from Canada especially, and if they're Air Force, we, we got a terrific welcome. They were glad to see us and made us most welcome. And we went to, all the, all the uh, Air Force went to uh, Bournemouth, and that was the holding station. And that's where we went first. And uh, from there on, we went to various stations in various phases of the training. And um, gradually, we worked our way to the uh, Bournemouth is in southern England. We went, gradually worked our way north until I ended up in um, Middleton St. George, which is just outside of Darlington in uh, Yorkshire. And um, the, the station we got on was 419 Squadron and they were flying Lancasters. So I became a navigator on a Lancaster. The, 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 crew, the crew becomes very, um, very much, um, I, I don't know how to describe it. We stick together, we, we, of course, we, we rely on each other when we're flying because if the guy, one guy doesn't do his job right, then it's gonna reflect on the others. But uh, generally speaking, we, uh, we mixed together very well. Uh, our, my, my, my pilot was a guy by the name of Tedford. Uh, the bombing was a guy by the name of Doug Spencer. And the, um, we had the, the only English guy on the, f the crew was a flight engineer. He was from uh, uh, Wales, I think. Because at that time, Canada wasn't producing flight engineers. So we had to rely on the English engineers. And we had two bombers, one from 
One was from BC, and I forget what the other was from. And the uh, wireless operator was from um, Toronto, and the bomb era was from uh, uh, Ontario. But we, we, uh, we seemed to meld together very well as a crew. You know, we stuck together. Yeah. So how does the uh, Lancaster fly? Is it a loud? Oh, yeah. Have you ever heard the, the engines? I've heard them from the ground, and yeah. they're thunderous. I'm wondering, they, uh, can you describe how it feels to be in there? Yeah, but well, you don't notice it so much in the air, really, but on the, on the ground, you, you can really feel it. And um, it, it was a very big airplane. You, you know, it, at the time when I was flying, I didn't think it was big, but I've gone to the Hamilton um, Museum, and they have one over there. And uh, <laughs> I realized how, how big the Lancaster was. So you were shot down uh, in Ger over Germany. Over Germany, yeah. I forget our target that night. I think our target was um, Merseyburg, uh, an oil refinery near Leipzig. And we had dropped our bombs. And it was about a half an hour afterwards we were shot down. I think an airplane come underneath us and give us a burst and got the engines on fire, and that was it. And I always thought that they, the German airplane had facilities to, to, uh, to um, zero in on our radar, that, and that's how they got there. But then I was talking to a fellow who was flying uh, um, mosquitoes. In, he, he flew in the, in the uh, um, bomber group, and he says it wasn't that. He says there was a, a flame coming out of the engine, and the, pilot, the German pilots could see that, and that's what they zeroed in on. That's what, that was his theory anyway. But anyway, we got shot down. Yeah. Very, it, it happened very quick, and I, I was just lucky. I, I really shouldn't have got out, really, because I was supposed to go at the front end of the aircraft, and the bomb aimer and the engineer were supposed to go ahead of me. But they couldn't get the darn um, hatch open. The, uh, you know, on the Lancasters, in the nose there, yeah. there's, a hat, there's an opening there that they can jump out. But it's, it couldn't get the darn hatch open for some reason, I don't know why. So I said to myself, well, I'm not going to get out that way. So I went in back and stood behind the pilot. And as I stood there, it, if you're familiar with the Lancaster, you know there's a lot of perspex around it. One of the windows, right there, about that size, just blew open. I pulled myself up. I looked, there was an engine there, still working. And the tail was there. And I said, if I, I'll probably hit one of those, but I didn't. I jumped out. I pulled the parachute, and the first thing I know is floating in the air at about 20,000 feet. Oh, so you bailed out? Yeah. Oh. And the parachute worked perfectly. Wow. We had, we, we, when we were flying, the, um, the pilot, he has a, a, um, a parachute that he sits on, so he's with it. But we have a, 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 what they, a parachute pack, which in an emergency, you take it and it attaches on the, on the harness on, on your chest. And then when you jump out, you pull a cord. And you're supposed to count 10, but I, would, I didn't. I counted three, I think it was, and pulled the cord. And the first thing you know, I was floating up. In the <laughs> My first impression was I was going up. <laughs> but gradually, I could see I was going down. And I was a bit concerned because I could hear the fighter plane still flying around. I thought maybe he'd maybe give me a burst, but he didn't. He ignored me, I think. And then I landed in trees. And they captured me. And, and uh, it, was, uh, it was about 1 or 2 in the morning. So they took me to a farmer's house, um, a very nice farmer. Uh, in Germany, th their farms seem to be different than ours. The, the houses in, are all together, like the farms are all together. I guess they did that in the olden days for protection. And the cattle are very close to the back door, and everything's very close. And the, um, this farmer, luckily, he could speak English, and he had spent nine years in Detroit working in the auto factories. Yeah. <laughs> and he was the most friendly guy, you know. He was German. He was German, yeah. I guess he came back uh, when the war started, or maybe he was called back, I don't know. But his, his wife had died in Detroit, and, but he was so, so uh, nice, nice fellow to talk to. And so what I, wa I wanted to give him my watch and my, and my um, wallet because I didn't want the Germans to get it. And you know, he said, oh, no, he says, I can't take that. He says, if I took that, and the Gestapo come in there and found that on me. He says they wouldn't ask any questions. He said they'd just shoot me. He, w he was scared of the Gestapo, so scared. 
But anyway, he was very nice to me, and I laughed. He says, what you need is a drink of snaps. I, says, I said, do you think so? Yeah. So he went and got the bottle of snaps, and he handed me the and he, and I, and I, I had never drank snaps before. Oh, I took it. Oh, I took it my throat. Oh, I said, that's too strong. He said, oh, no. He, he, he took it when he drank it himself. <laughs> he was a very, very friendly guy. But uh, he put me to bed, and I slept. In the, and the bed was a, um, a straw bed, a straw mattress, you know. I think they called it a palliasse or something. It, was, it, it wasn't uh, my idea of a bed, but it was very very comfortable, <laughs> because I was tired by then. This is about 2 o'clock in the morning. And so he put me to bed, and the next morning, the uh, local burgermeister came and took me, and they took me to the jail. But first, before they went to the jail, they took me to the, where the plane had crashed, and I could see the, uh, and they told me then that all the other six guys were dead, and they, I could see all the equipment uh, spread around. The Germans are very anxious to get equipment out of the Lancaster, and they stripped the whole thing. But I could see that the, uh, the parachutes were there. Some of them were open, some of them weren't. And then they took me, they, when I had jumped out of the airplane, I, I, I cut my eye. I don't know what happened. Either the, the parachute or when I landed in the trees, it cut my eye and it was bleeding. So they took me to a, a, a local airport which was a training place for uh, uh, young boys going into the German Air Force. I forget what they called them. But anyway, they, they had me in the infirmary. And you know in an infirmary they have a gl glass around and <laughs> these young boys came and looked at me, you know. And I could see them saying, oh, he's a terror flieger. <laughs> it's a terror flieger. <laughs> but anyway, they, they looked at me and I guess they thought to themselves, well, he, he's not much different than, than they were. <laughs> And from there, they, um, they took me, uh, yeah, that was the infirmary. Then they took, put two guards on me and took me to the railway station at Frankfurt. And from there, I was going to the interrogation center at, at Dulag Luft. And when we were in the railway station, there was an air raid on. And of course, all the people were running in and going to the air raid shelter. And we had to go down steps to get to the shelter. And as we were going, going in, the people coming in, they could see me, and I could tell by the look on their faces, they weren't too happy. They, they looked at me and they said, oh, terror figure, you know. And of course, some of these people, I can see their point. They, a lot of them had been bombed before and maybe lost relatives, and they wouldn't be thinking too highly of me. So what the two, these two guards did, they put me in a corner and they stood in front of me so the people couldn't see, see me as they went down the steps. And we, we got out of there without incidents. And when the ra air raid was over, we got on a, a small, a train, I think, and went to the, the um, interrogation center, which was very close to Frankfurt. And I stayed there about 11 days. And they interrogate me, trying to find out if I knew anything about our Air Force that they didn't know. And they were very, very, they had a lot of information on our squadron, on the, on the whole Air Force thing. And they were very, uh, very anxious to get me to say, to speak. And all we could give, we were allowed to say it was our name, our number, and our rank. And they, they, they got a bit miffed over that. And what, I was one young German officer, I guess he came from the, because he spoke very good English, he got very upset and he more or less threatened me. But the Geneva Convention said that all we need to tell them was our name, our number, and our rank. And that's all I told them and stuck to that. But I, I could tell by the way he was talking, he knew a lot more about our squadron than maybe I thought I knew myself. And then from there I went to another holding station, and from there I went to uh, the, the um, prisoner of war camp just outside of Nuremberg. Oh. And we stayed there about uh, maybe a month or so. And then as the advancing armies were coming uh, from uh, like the Americans and the British armies coming, they, the Germans had to move us away from the advancing armies. So they moved us on down towards uh, Munich. And we marched on the, on, uh, through, through uh, Bavaria. And uh, it was springtime and it was beautiful. I enjoyed, I, I enjoyed the march better than being under, uh, under the barbed wire. And we came to the Danube River and there was, some, there was a bridge there, but there was some problem about, it was, it was wired to bomb or something, so we had to wait there. And as we were waiting there, three American Mustangs came over 
flew over about a thousand feet. And I said to myself, God, those guys up there, they're probably going to give us a, a burst because it'd be, they would just be young pilots just like myself who would say to themselves, well, I don't know who they are down there, but we might, might as well give them a burst anyway. So they flew over and around, came back and flew over again. And there was a lot of Americans in our group and they got the, they, some of them got some sheets, some white uh, cloth and put the words PW on it. And they, I guess they got the message and they flew away. But luckily they didn't. See, up north uh, in northern Germany, some of the uh, fellows on the march were shot up by their own people because they didn't know, the pilots didn't know who they were and caused quite a, quite a few fellows died, I think, on that. But they didn't, they didn't, they didn't bother us. We, we continued on and we went to far as Regensburg and we stayed at a camp there. See, up in northern England, the, the weather was... It was winter time, and it was the bad. A lot of the fellows had a hard time. Whereas down in where I was in Bavaria, the weather was beautiful on the march. It's so great to get out the country, you know. It's a great country uh, just to walk through. And if we were, you know, alert, we could get into a farmhouse and get some get some food. I remember one. The guards, the guards were old were old men, you know. They, I think they knew the war was winding down. And they weren't too fussy, so we were able to sneak into a farmhouse. And I went to this one farmhouse, and there was a lady, in, an old, old lady. She was in the farmhouse. She, she looked at me, and she, I think she was a bit scared, but she had a big loaf of bread, like that. <laughs> so, so I said, Evans, he brought, yeah. So she takes the knife, and she cuts me a slice of bread, and she hands me the slice, but I took the whole loaf. <laughs> and she looked at me as if to say, you cheeky bugger. But she was, so, she was scared, you know, because she, she didn't know who I was. But when I took the whole loaf, she got, she, I thought she had the knife. I thought she was going to give me a jab, but she didn't. She, she didn't want to fight about it. So I, I had the whole loaf of bread, and she had the slice. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So that, what year was that? That was 45. In 45? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was 41. We, we got a bit mixed up on, like, we had no calendars or people tell us what day it was or anything, but... I remember on that march we were on, we went to a little village. And we, as we were going through it, a, a, a young girl, well, she wasn't young, I guess she was around 21, 22, come running out of the house. She could speak good, good English. And she said to us in the, in the march, you guys, you guys have had it now. Roosevelt has died. I think Roosevelt died that day. And she says, now the Russians will take over and you guys will have a hard time. I don't know, I don't know what her position was or how she could speak so good English, but she was thought we were... We were going to be in bad, bad trouble, but we, we didn't. We just laughed at her. <laughs> uh, when the war was, I, I can't remember when the war was actually over, but when we got to Regensburg, they put us in a camp. It wasn't a regular prisoner of war camp, but it was, um, I guess it was meant, it was a holding station. And um, when we were, when we were there, General Patton's army came through. See, the war was really pressing out on us, coming into into Munich, and we could hear the we, we, we I could see the soldiers. You know, you could see the soldiers in the field, and you could hear the gunshots. And as we were standing there, General Patton comes in, and he was sitting in a it was a a, a, a car bigger than a jeep, but similar to a jeep, and he had his medals and his revolvers, and and of course in our camp there's a lot of Americans. They they almost got down on their knees and adored him. General Patton, oh! Of course, he's a real showman, you know. He, but that, as far as we were concerned, that was our liberation. The doors were thrown open and we could go do what we wanted then. So that was, to me, that was the end of the war, really. Now, what date that was, I don't know. That was, the, the war was practically over, I think. Well, it was, we, um, what they did, they, they arranged to fly us into Reims, some of us, into Reims, because General Eisenhower's headquarters were there and he was going to come out and talk to us. But for some reason he couldn't make it, but uh, Air Vice Marshal, um, his, his deputy, he came and talked to us. But he didn't say very much, he just congratulated us you know, for what we did and everything. And then from there, we went to an airport and they flew us, flew us back to England. 
uh, w one of the things which really struck me w when we were at uh, Regensburg in, in the camp, released some, there was a lot of American boys there. And somebody, uh, one of the officers, somebody got the idea that the American boys should be taken to a concentration camp so they could see what was actually going on rather than read about it in the, in the newspaper or get secondhand. So they arranged to, to transport some, I went with them to a, a um, concentration camp. I think it was Buchenwald, I'm not sure. But it was, it was unbelievably terrible to see those fellows in there. They were all dying, and they, you know, they're pleading for us to do something. You couldn't do anything for them, really. But they were dying. And, that, and it struck me as terrible. Some, some people or some leash could do such terrible things to other people. But I think they got the message across to the American boys. They could see that it, was, it actually happened. It, it, it wasn't somebody's story. Some of the boys couldn't stand it, it was so, so terrible. When, when we, uh, they flew us out from Reims into London, to an airport north of London, and we stayed overnight, then we went down to Bournemouth and we got straightened around. What do you mean by straightened around? Hey, pardon? What do you mean by straightened around? Well, like got, our regular, got our old clothes and stuff like that, and okay. got, got some money and got some beer and got some food and <laughs> got going, yeah, yeah. got up to London. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. So, so when General Patton come, it came in, that was your moment that it was over, right? That's as far as I was concerned, yeah, that was it. Yeah, because he, you know, the doors were flown to open. Now, they advised us not to go out and try to uh, you know, get back to England on our own because the, the, the war was still on. The people were still fighting, and we could hear the bullets uh, being shot off quite near. And if you get caught in the middle like that, they're, they're not going to, you know, we... We, we had no identity, and they, they, they wouldn't think twice about shooting you, so they advised us to stay put, which we did. Mm. At least I did. Some of them, some of the guys took off and got back. I, I think these celebrations were over in England. The, the, the war must, there must have, D-Day, or V-E Day must have come and gone. But, uh, yeah, they, we were actually to get back home then, of course. Yeah. Well, it was nice to get home. It was kind of a letdown, though, because... The excitement was over. Oh. The war is over. <laughs> wow. who, who greeted you when you got home? My mother, my father, and, and friends. They had a party for me. But, you know, they, I, I wasn't too impressed, really, because the people back in Canada had no idea of what was going on in Europe. Absolutely not. You know, I was talking to one woman at, at the party they gave me. She said, Jim, how was the food? Oh, I said, the food was terrible. Yeah, she says, we're having a hard time. We, we only get a pound of butter a week. <laughs> you know, they have, they, 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 it didn't, um, didn't jive up to what was happening in Europe, to what they were going through in Canada, because as far as the Canadians were concerned, they didn't, they didn't know the war, war was on, I don't think. Yeah. Well, they, they knew, but they could never fathom. No, no, they couldn't. They couldn't. They couldn't realize it. A, a lot of them w wouldn't. Wouldn't if, if they went to that concentration camp. They wouldn't. It would be beyond them, I think. Yeah. But anyway, they were a long ways away from the war and weren't affected by, it, except by those people who didn't come back. So what did you do after the war? After the war, I went to law school. And I stayed for a while, but I could see after, I couldn't settle down. I guess my mind was someplace else. So I, I left there and, and started to work. And I, finally I worked for Blue Cross. And then that eventually became OHIP. And I spent my working days with OHIP okay. here. And I, I, I moved to, I started in Toronto, moved to Kitchener. Then I moved to Unionville. And I spent 35 years in Unionville. And our head office was down on, uh, down the Don Valley Parkway someplace. I forget where it was. Did you marry? Did you marry? Yeah, I got married. I have five kids. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, some, not really. The, the young people really aren't interested, I found out. I, I told them a bit, you know, what happened. They'd say, oh, Dad, come on, you know. And they, uh, young people are living in a, a different world, really. Yeah. I think they, they, that was my, and, and I didn't want to bore them with my experiences. They're in their 50s. 
Yeah, one, one, two of them, two of them are retired. Uh, two of them are, two of them are retired. Two of them are still working, and one boy he's, he's on a sort of a disability. Uh, yeah, they're 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 getting up there in years. They're interested now. Well, they must be asking you. Now. No, they're they're really not interested. They're they're more no. interested in what's going on now. Well, I'm interested. You're interested. Yeah. I'm very. My uh, my dad was a uh, World War II Corvette man. Oh, what on a Corvette? Yes, and um, oh, that that'd be. Interesting. Did I ever tell you my experience on a Corvette? No, please tell me. <laughs> well, what, when we were on the squadron, somebody in in the headquarters, someplace, I guess it was a combined headquarters, got the idea that guys in the Air Force should do, try to do a Navy job, Navy guys should try an Army job, Army job to try an Air Force job. So the pilot and I decided to go on a Corvette. And we were going to go across the English Channel to France. And the Corvette was stationed in the uh, in the uh, English Channel, in the East Channel. So we got on a train, went down there, and um, I think it was the Bedeck, I'm not sure. I forget the name of the Corvette, but what, what, what I found out, we got on the Corvette, and right away, we met the captain. And of course, the controversy comes up, what, what are the responsibilities of a captain on a Corvette to a captain on a, or a crew on an air, airplane? And I can see the, the there were two different worlds, completely. It just so happened there was a guy on the Corvette who was an able seaman who I went to school with. And of course, I wanted to talk to him right away, but I think that upset the captain. Ooh, we don't do that sort of thing. But anyway, we stayed on the Corvette, and the, and the weather got terrib terribly rough for some reason or other. The boat was flying, so we ended up in the wardroom and uh, started to drink. <laughs> and the weather didn't improve. And after about 3 o'clock in the morning, I said to the pilot, I think, I think we better get out of here <laughs> or, or we'll be here forever. <laughs> they, were, they were very friendly people, but I could see the, the uh, lines of command were so different than the Air Force. In the Air Force, in an airplane, everybody knows everybody. You call them by first name. and Everybody knows what their job is, and they do it. And whereas on a Corvette, it's a, it's a sort of a command thing. You do what you're told sort of thing. And uh, I noticed that right away, especially this, when I talked to this guy. And I shouldn't have been talking to him, because the captain, I don't think the captain on the boat liked it. Because <laughs> that, that isn't done, I don't think. But anyway, we kind of enjoyed it. I, I could see after I stayed in that Corvette about three o'clock in the morning that I was sure glad I wasn't in the Navy. <laughs> it's so, I, I, I was so confined. See, in the, air, in the airport, in the Air Force, we fly a flight or a mission, and it might go four hours, five hours, six hours, and you come back and you're through. You, you drop, you know, you leave everything behind you and, you and then you go to the pub or you go to whatever. Whereas in, on the Navy, you're on 24 hours doing that stuff, and on and on and on. You know, there's no end to it. And then you get some leave, of course, but it's 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 not an in and out sort of thing like it is in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, you notice that right away. That's what I noticed right away. Those guys on the on the on that ship, they were they were there until they could get a leave. Whereas we're we on the airplane for six hours, seven hours, eight hours, and then we're through. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's it was a long time ago, and. It, Bring back a lot of memories. Yeah. <laughs> of course, I, I have a I have a nature of rather being um, looking on the bright side. Of, you know, of seeing the humor of things, and uh, maybe that's what got me through the war. I don't know. I, I was never scared, uh, frightened. I, I knew terrible things could happen. They never did. And on that march, I really enjoyed walking through. Bavaria in the springtime. T today, if I wanted to go to Germany and walk through Bavaria, it would cost me a lot of money just to do, just to walk <laughs> through, through those mountains. <laughs> so it's a mountainous whereas, area. Whereas there, I had it all for nothing. Yeah. Do you ever go back to Europe? Yeah, gone back several times. Wow. And um, we, my wife and I went to um, 
Europe once, and we went to that area we marched, and I couldn't recognize a thing. I couldn't find the road or couldn't find anything. You actually went back to Germany? Yeah, oh yeah. Wow. But I should have, I really should have gone back to that farmer, really. But I, I had forgotten where he, what, what, where he was. But it, you know, when you're traveling, you, you have you only got so much time. But we went to that area around um, north of uh, Munich, where on uh, where we marched down there. But I couldn't find the road. Uh, things have why. changed. Probably changed the it's, road. It's a very, very rural country and very, uh, I won't say backward, but the the farming isn't isn't on the level that we farm in this country here. You might in 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 that part of Germany. When we were marching, you might see an old, old lady out in the field with a plow, trying to plow the earth, whereas you would never see that in, in Canada. Wow. I don't think. No. But of course, the, the, the manpower situation in Germany was, was um, desperate, really, because they were running out of manpower and running out of everything, food and everything else. Yeah. So, um have you ever met a veteran, a German veteran? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I, I was a, my brother lives in British Columbia, and I visit, used to visit him periodically. And we went to the air show at, um, I forget, it was on the island, I think it was. Ab, uh, Ab, Aberf Abbotsford, yeah, the air show at Abbotsford. That's not on the island, it's on the mainland. And, and went the, they had an air show there. And when I was there, this guy comes along and started talking. And he was in the German Air Force. And he's a nice fella. He come to Canada. He became part of the uh, part of the um, people that were running the air show because he knew a lot about airplanes. And we were talking. And I said, I, I was in the Air Force. I used to bomb Germany, I said. And uh, he said, well, where are you? Yeah. He said, well, where are you flying? And I told him, Lancaster's. Oh, he says, he says, well, he says, I was a fighter pilot. He says, but I never shot Lancasters. <laughs> 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 he he want to make that point. He wasn't shooting at me. But very nice chap. And he, he, he fitted right into Canada. He got involved in, in, in the air, air business over here, and uh, he seemed to be enjoying it. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. That's a good story. Yeah, <laughs> good story. And you're the right he, person for, to meet. You're the right spirit. And, yeah, and but he seemed to want to impress upon me. No, he says, I never, I never shot you guys. <laughs> he probably did, you know. Do you remember what kind of plane shot you down? No, I don't. No, it, I, I didn't, so uh, much going uh, on. Was, uh, some sort of a fighter plane, I think. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't see it at all. Yeah. I, I heard it flying around after I jumped out, and I was afraid that he might see me you know, floating down and give me a shot, but he flew away. Yeah. I guess he decided, let me alone. Let yeah. me float down peacefully. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you survived that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's quite the thing. Well, it was, it was great to hit the ground. It was funny, when I, when I was coming down, one of my first impression when I did up in that parachute, that I was going up. I don't know what, what gave me that impression, Maybe but eventually... Yeah, I was going up, but anyway, I could see, I could see by the there was a slight horizon. I could see I was falling, not too fast, but then as I got closer to the ground, you notice how fast you're falling. And I landed in trees, heavy trees, big trees. So it was winter time, and it was all snow on the ground. My, I couldn't see very well, so I decided, you know, we had this harness on. I decided to get out and get out of the parachute and slide down. I looked down again. I was up about 50 feet. Oh, I said to myself, I better not jump down there. I'll be breaking my leg. So I pulled over to the side of the tree and got out of the harness and, and slimmered down. Yeah. Wow. It was, it was wintertime there, a lot of snow. Yeah. I guess it was, um, I guess it was a snowy part of the country. Very rural, very rural part. You know, when you jump out in a parish, you could, it's, it's, it's dangerous because you could land on hydro wires or in a lake or on a highway. Or, but I landed in the trees, which was a good place to land, really. Yeah. I, was, I was a bit miffed, really. See, a lot of people blamed or accused Bomber Command of bombing civilians. And, of course, we did. We, we bombed what we called, um, you know, bomb, bomb everything. 
But in, in war, you, you bomb what you have to, and you do what you're told. Some people, when I came here first, some people said, you're bomb, oh yeah, you people, you bomb women and children. And it made me kind of mad, but really, people shouldn't, and then they met that film, remember, did you ever see that film by the uh, uh, brothers, uh, what was the name of them? They did a film on Bomber Command. Uh, I forget their name. Anyway, it was a terrible film, terrible. And it kind of made fun of Bomber Command and what we were doing. Maybe we, they gave the impression maybe we shouldn't have been doing that. But in a war, you do what you have to do. You don't say, well, I don't think I'll do that today because I don't think that's a good idea. You do what you have to do. Yeah. And we, we bombed wherever we could, I guess. No, well, it's either they, they, thought, they thought the technology was perfect, but it wasn't because there's so many different factors. There's the wind, there's the speed of the aircraft, there's the other aircraft around, and the, yeah, so many things happening to... to the flak. You know, flak and everything, yeah. But um, I, I think, well, maybe, I, I was a bit... See, when, at the end of the war, the head of fighter command in England was decorated by the Queen, but the head of Bomber Command wasn't, mm. and he didn't he didn't get a, um, a commendation, and that was I think because of of the bombing that he was doing, uh, um, Air Commodore or Air Vice Marshal Harris, but I th his idea was that he could shorten the war or maybe finish the war through bombing. And maybe, maybe he had a good idea, I don't know. He sure ended. Yeah, that's right. The, the thing is, that if, if they didn't do that, maybe they'd be fighting on the ground for a long time. But I, I remember reading a, um, an article once about when they were bombing Hamburg. Uh, I wasn't on the raid, but it was a big um, fire. Um, you know, a fire started. Once a fire starts, it sort of escalates. And the some... A German general said to somebody, I don't know who he said it to, he says, we can't stand another one of those. So Germany was collapsing due to the fact that the civilians were being bombed and were shortening the war. And from that point of view, I think the bombing was justified. Because to, to do it on the ground would take maybe much longer and cost many more lives. That's only my own idea, mm. but I but I'm glad that they they kept up the bombing and caused a lot of havoc. Of course, a lot of people use the view that the Germans bombed England and we we were justified in bombing them back. Sort of. I, I don't know whether that's right or not, but they they did a lot of havoc in England in their bombing. A lot of, they bombed a lot of civilians, killed a lot of civilians. But they did it and that was it. Then the war ended. Yeah. A wish. Yeah, a, a message or a wish for the future. No, I, I couldn't get into that. That's, you know, we're moving pretty fast and I couldn't give them any advice. We are moving. Don't go to war, but keep out of a war. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a pretty hard thing to do. Yeah, but you're, you're right, we are moving fast. The, the, the war, everything's spinning, communications and... Yeah, it's getting out of hand. Yeah. But anyway, I, 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 a lot of people worry about what's going to happen, but I, th I, I don't think we have to worry too much. The young people should be able to handle it. Yeah, well that's good that you have faith in future generations, that's good. Oh yeah, sure. If yeah. we lose faith, we're dead. Yeah, that's true. We never lost faith in prison camp. That's one thing I noticed. People, people always look forward to something better. I laughed uh, in prison camp. Uh, when a new fellow comes to prison camp, first thing they ask him, How, how's the war coming? How's the war coming? <laughs> and of course, me being rather facetious, would say, oh, the war's practically over, don't worry about it. And they'll say, oh, don't tell us that, we've heard that so often. 
and we, we would sort of they would sort of be deflated that we would say that it, you know that the war is practically over but to them the war was still going on and they're still in prison camp they're not out yet but um, coming coming from England into Germany at that time in say December 45 I knew that the war the way things were going that wasn't going to last that much longer just a matter of time because um, you know Germany Germany was being plastered by, from the from the uh, allies and uh, Russia was coming on the other way and killing them there it was, um, it was inevitable really but we were one of the big concerns about being in prison camp at that time was that you know they would get kind of nasty and maybe shoot us all or do something with us uh, or the, give us to the Russians or something but nothing ever happened it was very very uh, it worked out very well and they f flew us out without too much too much of a problem did they respect you Your pardon did they respect the Geneva Convention when you were appealed oh yeah the Germans are very big on that yeah they they, uh, they re respected um, the, the the rules of war so to speak did, they, you, did they feed you right? And well, uh, yeah, well, the food was, was terrible. But at, you must remember at that time, Germany was, had no food. They were, they were right down to rock bottom. Even the, you know, the, the uh, general public was starving too. So we, we couldn't expect any, anything in the line of food. It was, the food was terrible. We if they bought that food that we were eating in prison camp here today, you, you, you wouldn't you would you wouldn't eat it you, you couldn't but when you're hungry you'll eat anything I remember once on <laughs> when we were on the march I, I got into this farmhouse I don't know how I did but I got and there was a trough there and the pigs were eating this stuff and I looked at it and I picked it up it looked pretty good so I, I thought I'd have some so I ate some it was pretty good nice it was uh, it was sorry I don't know what it was <laughs> It was almost better than the food we were getting. <laughs> so, what was the what was the take uh, on all the fellas here and yourself when they when you heard that they were doing the Bomber Command Memorial? Your pardon? What was the the feeling and the take or uh, the fellas here and yourself when you learned about the Bomber Command Memorial in England? Being well, we, we thought it was about time. You know, they did something to to recognize us because. By not recognizing, they're really saying that those guys that died, died for no reason. And that's not right. The bomber command losses were terrible, you know, terrible. Unbelievable. Especially your, your squadron. Yeah. Your squadron had lost. Oh, lost. terrible losses. And the, the, were, the, the who were being lost were really young guys uh, who were really, you know, um, the top of the top of the rank, really, as far as people are concerned, they were all uh, well educated, and uh, you know, the great drain on the country that they should be lost like that, but they were, and and looking at that way, the, the bomb the bombing can't be short, looked at as being in vain. It 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 did it did help bring the war to an end. Same with it. I guess you get the same theory of the atomic bomb in Japan. A lot of people say we they, they shouldn't have used the atomic bomb, but by using the atomic bomb, they saved a lot of hassle, a lot of men. And somebody was saying I was reading the other day that if they tried to conquer Japan by invading it, that it would take many more men, many more material to do that, and it would go on for much longer. So it's a matter of, of uh, uh, I think, a matter of how you look at it and, and what war does, really, or what you, what you want to accomplish in war. A lot of people criticize the Americans for using that atomic bomb and still do to this day. Yeah. And, of course, the question is, will it ever be used again? Or will we ever have a situation like they had during the war when we were bombing people like that? Will that ever happen again? I think uh, um, your attitude about seeing the glass half full 
like you said, it kept you going. And I loved hearing about, um, you know, like that farmer from Detroit. Yeah. And the lady with the loaf of bread. And, yeah. And uh, the walk in Hamburg. You know, you saw the the glass half full, and it kept you going. And that's a that's a, a special quality about you, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, because it's uh, there was a lot of bad things, and you saw a lot of things that, uh, you know, this glass half full has helped you to. Yeah, I guess so. To live through life and to rationalize it. And but I think as time goes on, people will forget. Although they might later on, like in the Second World, First World War, people are starting to remember what happened there. But I think after the war was over, uh, the First World War was over, say in the twenties, people forgot that. Like they, like we have a tendency to forget our our last war here. The other thing is things are moving much faster now than they were twenty years ago or forty years ago, and people are much much uh, much busier doing other things. They, they haven't got time to think of that past anymore. The past is past. Mm 